a very very warm welcome to you I've been looking at for the first time for a long long time uh, you spent in search of the miraculous and I've discovered a few things which I I wasn't aware of before uh, I'm sure that a few of you will know that the inner content the true meaning of in search of the miraculous is written in between the lines there's actually more said in between the lines than what is said in the lines this is quite a common uh, it's quite common knowledge in, in fourth way circles and I've discovered by reading it, I've read it from the first page to the last and scrutinized it and the main impression I'm getting from it is that something is concealed like profoundly uh, for whatever reason I'm not sure but it's concealed uh, the the essential element of the teaching and most importantly the person to whom the teaching is is related directly a certain George Gurdjieff whoever Gurdjieff really was that person or entity is concealed within the pages of In Search of the Miraculous and I've just come to chapter 16 which I've been looking at a little while ago recently and it's an account of Gurdjieff going from the station platform onto a railway carriage and transforming into a completely different being and I will read it with you and share it with you now and I feel that the person that people were seeing the people who were close to Gurdjieff weren't seeing who he really was and this is more or less explained within this passage it's about about a page from In Search of the Miraculous I'll read it and then explain it to you as, as I read or when I finish reading it and it, it goes as follows it's a very very famous passage from In Search of the Miraculous but a very very important one a very interesting event took place in, connect, in connection with his departure. This happened at the railway station. We were all seeing him off at the Nikolevsky station. I beg your pardon, Nikolevsky station. G was standing talking to us on the platform by the carriage. He was the usual G we had always known. After the second bell, he went into the carriage. His compartment was next to the door and came to the window. He was different. In the window, we saw another man, not the one who had gone into the train. He had changed during those few seconds. It is very difficult to describe what the difference was, but on the platform, he had been an ordinary man like anyone else and from the carriage a man of quite a different order was looking at us with a quite exceptional importance and dignity in every look and movement as though he had suddenly become a ruling prince or a statesman of some unknown kingdom to which he was traveling and to which we were seeing him off. Some of our party could not at the time clearly realize what was happening, but they felt and experienced in an emotional way something that was outside the ordinary run of phenomena. All this lasted only a few seconds. The third bell followed, the second bell almost immediately, and the train moved out. I do not remember who was the first to speak, who was the first to speak of this transfiguration of G. When we were left alone, and then it appeared that we had all seen it, though we had not all equally realised what it was while it was taking place, but all without exception had felt something out of the ordinary. G had explained to us earlier that if one mastered the art of plastics 
one could completely alter one's appearance. He had said that one could become beautiful or hideous. One could compel people to notice one or one could become, in italics, actually invisible. What was this? Perhaps it was a case of plastics. One with the art of plastics, one could become actually invisible. I'm getting here that the person, the being, the entity that taught people on this planet from the early 1920s in groups up until 1949 uh, was never visible. The real entity behind the image that was given to his pupils of George Gurdjieff and the thought went through my mind of shape-shifting that this was someone who was a supernatural being. Yesterday I read chapter after chapter of Beelzebub's tales and it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to believe that that work was written by a human hand. And if what is written in there about other planets and the life on those planets is true, which I believe it is, the book has not been written by a mortal human being. It's as plain as the nose on one's face, the more one goes into it. And when we, re we read in between the lines of In Search of the Miraculous, almost every page, we actually feel something which is concealed all the way through it from the first page to the last. There are things <coughs> which Gurdjieff told you, Spensky, and he says in some of the earlier chapters that he would reveal these things later in the book, personal things that this Gurdjieff person, Gurdjieff person had told him, but you, Spensky, never reveals them. And never in his life did he reveal them. Something is going on at a very, very deep, profound level, which, as I say, is concealed. And the concealment could be due to one's level of consciousness, especially with Beelzebub's tales, but also with In Search of the Miraculous, that the consciousness needs to completely transform itself onto a higher level outside of space and time to actually understand these words. And I feel that through my involvement in the work, I've had first-hand experience of things that have happened with people I've been with, and they are of a supernatural nature. And having these experiences actually illumines the work and it gives it a vivifying factor. Otherwise, you're just reading words on a piece of paper uh, and it's not it doesn't elucidate, it doesn't vivify, it doesn't ultimately transform, it remains words on a piece of paper. And Gurdjieff, just forgetting Beelzebub's tales for a moment, just within In Search of the Miraculous, had access to an unknown form of teaching, to a to a teaching that came from another level of existence. And to get that across into a human mind is borderline impossible. But this image we have seen of him getting on the train, not only by Uspensky, but by a number of other people, that he was a different man. One could say, yes, the person looks different. They've moved their location to somewhere else. Yes, they look different. But the account we are getting is that it was a different man. And then immediately after the account, Uspensky speaks about Gurdjieff, speaking about what one can do if one has mastered the arts of plastics. The art of plastics. And I've spoken to, to about half a dozen people over the last two days 
about what this could mean uh, and we have not as of yet come to any particular conclusion. Plastics, something that is easily transformed and changed into different shapes. And I thought of Gurdjieff as a, a Proteus-like figure. And Proteus, is, as we know, is the god of the sea. Uh, and he's able to change shape and form at will. So we're back to shape-shifting. So a higher, a higher level of consciousness has been given to Gurdjieff. And when we ourselves achieve that high level of consciousness, only then can we understand the work. Otherwise, it's just, it's meaningless, unless it becomes a living experience and we feel it in our emotional center. And I'm now convinced that nobody knows who Gurdjieff was, who he really was. Um, if anything, he was a master of disguise uh, and could change from one form to another, as he did in the train, in the blink of an eye. And being aware of this when we read his works shifts our attention into a different arena and then the whole picture changes. This work is profoundly mystical and supernatural and one of the major aims of the work is to develop so, so much one's level of being that one scales the ray of creation and gets closer to the absolute, the most holy, the most holy son absolute. And in doing so can actually become not human, but immortal and divine. Uh, who was Mr. Gurdjieff? Indeed. Thank you very much now.